Hello, everyone around the world. Welcome to our uh, beautiful, beautiful Global Astronomy Month, 12th edition this year. Can't believe it. It's been 12 years now that we've been doing Global Astronomy Month, the largest festival of astronomy and night sky in the world. And you're here joining me. I'm Andrew Fazekas, the night sky guy here for Astronomers Without Borders hosting this very special Facebook Live that we have for you. I've got the chat room open. The comments are coming in. We'd love to see where you're watching our Facebook Live tonight. And it's a special night too. Of course, it's this beautiful, large full moon of April. It's called the pink or flower supermoon. Maybe you've got clear skies and wherever you are around the world, you can see that moon. It's the same moon we see all over the world, we share the same sky. One people, one sky. That is what Astronomers Without Borders is about. We've got 12,000 members in over 143 different countries. We invite you to join our community. We're here to build and cultivate community through astronomy and our love of the night sky. That is our shared heritage around the world. We've got people around. I'd, I'd like to say a big thank you to uh, Marcelo from Brazil joining us. We've got Kyle from Florida, USA, Edith from New Mexico, uh, in, and even from, oh, from Canada too. Wow. There are people everywhere joining us. Uh, love to see you. Please put in your location where you're coming from. And if you have any questions about our Facebook Live tonight from our very special guests, please put it into the comment section. We'd love to hear what you have, uh, any questions for our special guest speakers today. And, uh, you know, without further ado, of course, I want to jump right in. Today's pres uh, Facebook presentation is very special because we're looking at the cosmovision of the universe from the perspective in terms of cultural astronomy. Astronomy is a shared heritage of all humanity, every one of us. And it's incredible to think, and it's one of the most ancient sciences that we have. And you know, before there was uh, internet, before we had our smartphones or, uh, you know, tablets and all of that, thousands of years ago, the main entertainment of people was looking up at the night sky. Uh, and really, that is something that's gone through, through countless generations to us even today. And it's enthralling, and it gives a special feeling to all of us when we look at the night sky. And cultures everywhere around the world have their own stories, myths, uh, and uh, their own science regarding 
of course, the night sky. Cultural history is big. And tonight we have two very special cultural astronomy presentations for you. And I'm really excited about this because I think we're all going to learn so many interesting aspects. And we're, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, the, uh, uh, a very special cultural astronomy presentation from Easter Island of the Rapa Nui culture. And we're also looking at the indigenous people of Chile, the Mapuche culture as well. So we're going to look at two very beautiful presentations, I think, in terms of what these different cultures, how they have looked at the night sky, what it has meant to to, to them, and uh, looking at their different perspectives. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our uh, first speaker of tonight. And uh, that here we are, uh, Edmundo Edwards. Are you, can you, can you see me? Oh, let's see if the audio, hold on. Oh, I think you're you're muted there. It's, there we go. Can you see me there? Ah, now we can hear okay. you. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, wonderful. to tell you a little bit about this faraway place where we live, the Easter Island in the middle of the Pacific and about its past culture. It's fantastic. Ed Edmundo, maybe you can tell us a little bit about yourself, of your, your background, before you start your presentation. Well, I, I studied archaeology at the beginning, and then I was working for many years in charge of the uh, archaeological survey of French Polynesia, and also on Easter Island. I'm married here on Easter Island. I've been living here for the last 60 years. And uh, well, I've been working in archaeology and natural uh, archaeology for many, many years in this part of the Pacific. Fantastic! It's in, uh, and uh, I have to ask, how's the how's the weather there? I'm in Montreal, Canada, in eastern North America. It's oh. cold here. It's freezing, freezing temperature. What? Tell me, make me jealous, Edmundo. <laughs> oh, you know, here it's it's not really warm, but it's. Uh, it's only about 23 degrees centigrade, and uh, we have a little bit of wind. We have a beautiful sailing ship, the Esmeralda, a four-man sailing ship from the Chilean Navy, anchored in front of us across the hotel. And uh, the weather is going to be good, and we won't have a very good night for sightings, but it's a very interesting time of the year, as a lot of important stars uh, will appear in this time are important in their calendar it's fantastic fantastic edmundo we would love to hear uh, uh and see your presentation uh let me put that up for you so that it uh it's working here Bye. we go i think uh it's up now on our screen and uh i'm okay. going to pass it pass the microphone to you okay fine Okay. Well, as we are a very far away place in the middle of the Pacific, I have to tell you a little bit about the origins of the Polynesians and of the Easter Islanders. Around uh, six to five thousand years before present, a lot of uh, groups, indigenous groups that were living on the coast of China, they started moving into the Pacific. And the first island that they settled was Taiwan. And from Taiwan, they went into the Philippines, and then some of the groups moved eastwards and they moved towards the northern part of Papua New Guinea. And other groups went and settled uh, Borneo, the Celebes, and what is today the Philippines. All these uh, people had a common origin that is of South China, and they had an ancestor worship. So they believed that uh, the ancestors were the gods of creation that lived in the heavens and the skies. And um, as they move eastwards, all these uh, groups of people called now Austronesian because they spoke this common language. So although we are very isolated, there are some words that you will find in Easter Island that are the same all the way to Madagascar. So it is surprising, but we all have the same origins that come from 
Southeast Asia. And um, around uh, 4,000 years before present, they started settling the northern part of the Solomon Islands, and from there they moved to Samoa, Tonga, and Fiji, that way settled around 1,500 before present. And uh, these uh, islanders were then, uh, from there, they extended towards eastern Polynesia, and they went and settled all the rest of the Pacific. These people were a group of, that was called the Lapita culture, because the first site that was excavated was in, uh, in New Caledonia, and the site was called Lapita, so that's where it derives its name. And this culture, they had a very fine pottery that is very characteristic of all this area that has these beautiful drawings on the tops of the jars. And uh, that's how you can recognize the Lapita. But once they arrived to Samoa and Tonga, they found themselves that uh, there was these islands were volcanic in origin, so they didn't have any clay. So you couldn't make any pottery. So from then onwards, they didn't make any pottery, the abandoned pottery. And as the time passed and they cut their roots all the way with Southeast Asia, they developed a new culture that is what we call Polynesian. And those are the ancestors, direct ancestors of the Eastern Islanders. And from Samoa, Tongan Fiji, that is their homeland, they continued eastwards and then they settled all the way to South America. And they discovered, they arrived to southern Chile to East Amocha, and they arrived to another archaeological site that's called Tunquen, probably around 1000 before present. And uh, from South America, they introduced, from Polynesia, they introduced the chicken to South America, and they brought back from South America the gourd and the uh, sweet potato. And uh, they were great navigators, and uh, they had a great knowledge of the sky. And uh, they had uh, written tablets in the case of Easter Island, in which they would write their traditions. And although they have not been deciphered, we know that that, according to our tradition, is what they had right written. And uh, they believe that when uh, the world was created, there was nothing, there was just a great void. And in this void, then there was Father Sky and Father Earth, and uh, they were constantly copulating in this void. So they gave uh, birth to a large number of children that are the gods of the sky and the earth. And as they were in this very small space, they decided then to raise the sky. So they grabbed some posts, according to some traditions in some islands, According to others, they just raised each one on top of the shoulders of the next one and pushed up the sky. And as they pushed up the sky, then light came in and uh, separated them. And uh, that's how all life later was created because these gods, they started them copulating with different uh, things and gave birth to all the uh, different elements that exist in life. So the gods were who gave birth to the humans, and uh, the firstborn son was a chief. And the chief could trace his descent from the most important gods of creation. So here you have some uh, uh, drawings made in the Pomotu Archipelago that show this process in which they were pushing up the heavens. So you have uh, many, many heavens, one on top of the other. They are transparent, they are infinite, but they're all there, and in your different heavens, you have different gods that live there. And uh, these gods are, of course, the ancestors of the chiefs of uh, the, the different islands. So what you have in, uh, uh, as a society, you have a paramount chief, that is Ariki Mao, who can trace his descent from the gods of creation. Then you have the nobles, you have the priests, then you have the warriors and the experts, then you have the commoners, and then you have just the servants that would work for all this group. And that was their social organization. And the chiefs, in the case of Israel, as they could trace the descent to the gods of creation, 
they would carve statues that would represent these ancestral spirits. They were carved in a mountain that's called Rano Araku. That is this mountain you can see in this photograph. And in the foreground, you can see some of the statues. There were more than 400 statues that were carved and moved out of these quarries. And there's also about another 500 that are still laying around in the quarries themselves. Um, the statues were placed in altars all around the coast of the island. And each one of these statues represents a chief. And it had a name that starts with the prefix of Bariki. And uh, when the statues were stood up upon the altars, they didn't become, uh, apparently, they, they didn't become gods until they would carve out the eyes and they would put a pair of eyes that were made out of coral with an obsidian or uh, some other stone as an iris. In that moment, then the life of Satya would become live and it would represent this ancestor. The sky was, of course, besides the gods, was alive. They believed that all these things that were created from the gods of creation, from the stones, uh, every material things, they were all alive and stones could talk and you could communicate with them. So all the world in which we live was a living world in which man had communication with and took care of and guarded. And um, you had a astronomer priest. These are some photographs from the Marquesas Islands. One is from last century. And these were the astronomer priests on the left-hand side. And then you had the wayfinder that was a navigator on the right-hand side. I won't go into Polynesian navigation because that's very long, but we'll go into the sky watcher that is a priest that was uh, reserved to the elite, only the nobles of the most important descent group could uh, become priests. They were trained in special schools across the whole Pacific and also in Easter Island. And they were in charge of observing all the astronomical phenomena and uh, they announced the calendrical events, activities, festivities, prohibitions, everything that was marked by the appearance or disappearance of certain stars. They also were uh, specialists in prophecy and magic, so they had a very important role in society. And uh, the most important thing is they would announce when migrational birds and turtles and other uh, fish and other food resources would be coming over to the island because these arrive usually in the same dates when certain stars would appear. So they would mark the stars, the stars would mark when the time of the migration would occur. And um, they, as all other men in the past, they they had uh, mankind, they had all kinds of figures that they made in the stars. And uh, they had fish hooks and boats and fish and, and migrational birds. And there were also just stars that would indicate people that had run away or a family that had gone to the sky or children or would illustrate different stories of their traditions of the different islands. So not all the stories are the same in all these uh, appearances that you have of the sky. Um, you had an annual cycle of activities. It was controlled by the moon and by the stars and constellations. And these astronomer priests were in charge of uh, informing about these events. They had a lunar calendar, 28 nights of the moon. They would uh, interchange. They would have to add sometimes a few days uh, to some of the months to be able to make them coincide with uh, the day. Uh, they had, uh, the, by the moon, they would control all the everyday activities. And by the tides and fishing, they would know the best times to go out to catch their food and uh, also the best times of the year for plantations. And uh, by the stars and constellations, they would then fix when the rituals and festivals would take place and which were the best periods for planting and harvest and the time of the arrival of migrational species, as I was mentioning before. Uh, 
And uh, the priest used to live in these towers that were around the coast of the island. And there was a small stone tower. And they would live there with their acolytes. And uh, they would teach them there how to watch the sky and what they had to see. Some of the towers, uh, there's about 26 that we have um, investigated here on the island. And all of them have a small doorway. And the doorway is all the time located or uh, pointed towards an important star. It can be Orion, or it can be the rise or set of the Pleiades. But usually an important star in the calendar is marking the entranceway to the tupa of these structures. And then around these structures, they would build small towers. And these towers, when you align them with the tupa or between themselves, would indicate the rising or set of important stars during their uh, year. They were all the time watching the helical rising and setting and the chronicle rising and setting of different stars. And uh, they also were used as indicators for the time of fishing of different species would arrive to the island. The most important star, of course, was the Pleiades. The Pleiades, uh, Matariki, and most of Polynesia, and probably also in the time of the Lakita, because most of these names and their traditions, you can trace them back in the 36 different languages of Polynesia. So if you can trace them back in the 36 languages, it means that probably it was what it was known by in the time of the Lakita, their ancestors, 4,000 to 5,000 years ago. So what we know is that the, the Matariki, the Pleiades, was an important uh, event. It was a, a big family in uh, New Zealand. It's still celebrated up to today. And when the Pleiades appeared in Easter Island, the first new moon, I mean, I mean the first full moon after the appearance of the Pleiades in its helical rise around June, would indicate the first day of the year. And that was the beginning of their lunar months. The, the most important thing that we have in Easter Island and what you've all heard about are the huge stone statues. The, whole, the statues were made at these quarries that I was showing the photograph before. And uh, the stone by which they would, which they would carve the statues is called the Stone of the Pleiades because it was considered to be the most sacred stone you could find here on the island. And it is a stone in which the ancestors were carved. So it is a stone of the Pleiades. And um, on the eastern headland of the island, there's a, a place where they would go and watch the Pleiades. And there's a little stone that has been carried there from a lava flow not far away. And it is a natural stone that has some small indentations, some cupels. And uh, these cupels were supposed to uh, signal the Pleiades. There's also petroglyphs in many places around the island that are related with all the petroglyphs usually have to do with migrational birds, fish, short turtles, or whatever, that with food resources would arrive to the island. And in this case, you have this one with 28 moons. Um, and some other indications that I don't know what it means. And then usually on the stones close by, you find all these other indentations and marks that probably have something to do with their uh, calendar. In uh, Matariki, the Pleiades, I was telling you, is very celebrated up to today in New, in, uh, in New Zealand. And on Easter Island, the people want to go back and want to make a festival in the following years when Matariki again appears. In Aquaquiti and in some of the altars that have been restored or where we have been working, uh, we have found that uh, they are also oriented towards the rising or setting of important stars. In this case, uh, Aquaquiti is oriented uh, perpendicular to the setting of the Orion Belt. The three stars of Orion Belt, they go exactly behind the center statue. You can see it in the little uh, photograph on the top 
right hand side. And then uh, in uh, we, we, there are other stones that have all these cubes that we don't know exactly what they are. In this case, it would really look like this. This was supposed it was said to be a map of the stars, but it didn't say what stars it would represent. It. But if you put Sagittarius on uh, the, the, the same sort of drawing, you can identify these these cupels that would be in the same position as those stars in the map of Sagittarius. So probably there are many stars, I mean many stones, that are close to these petroglyphs and close to these sites where the priests used to live that were maps of the stars and we are now investigating a very large one in the other end of the island. Uh, here you have a, another group of petroglyphs and as you can see we have all these little holes where probably a post could have been placed in the past and could have been indicating some of the directions of rising or setting of stars or just be a map of the stars. In our planetarium, we have all the children of the island. We have about a thousand children that visit us a year. We have courses there. We go out to do research with them in the field. And uh, they all have a great time. And we have them practically every day once the planetarium is open. We have it closed now because we haven't had time to take care of uh, all the new regulations that we have were imposed with the uh, with all the diseases we have, and, but now we are going to open by the end of this month. So that's what I tell you a little bit about Easter Island. There's much more that we can talk, but it would have to be with more space and time. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm willing to try and answer all I can. Thank you very much, uh, Edmundo. That's uh, fantastic. I mean, it's, uh, I got to go and visit. I have to go and visit now. This is uh, <laughs> it's very impressive. <laughs> fantastic stuff. And yes, we are opening this up for questions. So um, anyone that do, does have questions, just put it into the comment section and we'll be able to pick it up from there. Uh, we'll be... Uh, uh, we'll be looking at uh, your questions after the second presentation. So if you have the two for the two presentation, if you have something for Edmundo or uh, Yasmin's upcoming lecture, uh, just put it into the comment section and we will get back to you. Definitely. So uh, so stay with us, uh, Edmundo. We'll, we'll come back at, uh, to you after and we'll have a little... Uh, talk after um, a discussion chat after Yasmin's lecture uh, and let's see if our second speaker is uh, there Yasmin welcome <laughs> oh let me see if your audio your audio is off try again hello thank you oh. for having me today oh there you are Yas Yasmin we can hear you <laughs> Um, Yasmin uh, Catriccio is uh, working with the Office of Education and Public Engagement at Associated Universities Incorporated, and she's a physics educator from Chile uh, of Mapuche origin. And so you have a unique window uh, into this culture, Yasmin, and uh, to, to be able to share this with us. Welcome to the show, first off, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for making this is this is spaces where people can share uh, their knowledge and the connection that we have with our roots. Of course, this is very important. And I think it's amazing to see the variety of interpretations of the night sky and what the night sky has meant to people around the world. So this is just a fantastic glimpse into, a, you know, two particular unique places in the world. So, uh, Yasmin, I don't want to waste any more time. I want to get right in. I want to hear your uh, presentation. So I'm going to share your screen. Let me see. I'm going to get that up here. Um, I think we should see it right now. There it is. Okay. Let me see what I have the presentation here. 
Uh, it shouldn't be here, but I don't see it. Oh, here it is. Oh, is this one? Mm, no. What am I doing? Can I just, uh, let me see what I'm doing here. Sure, sure, Share of course. Screen. We saw, we had it there. Okay, just. The beauty of the internet, of course, technology. We're at its mercy. <laughs> yes, I don't know. Let me close this my presentation and open <clears throat> and open it again because it's not. Um, let me let me see something. Let me try one more time. We just did this like ten minutes before <laughs> that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, right. And now. Oh. Well, while you're working on that, uh, I'll just share with everybody that, of course, Yasmin is special to AWB because she does sit on our board of directors. So we're so happy to have her. And uh, AWB is uh, prides itself on having people from everywhere around the world joining us. And uh, Yasmin is a key player in Astronomers Without Borders. So we were excited to have her share her insights. And I believe, Yasmin, you have your presentation uh, set up. There we go. Yes. <laughs> yes. <stuff>. All right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. Uh, so, yes, my name is Yasmin Caditeo. I am from Chile, from the south of Chile. My city is Chillán, which is a five hours driving from Santiago to the south of Chile. Um, I'm going to do this presentation, but before I start, um, I want to share something with the public. Uh, and it is, I am, I am a Bote, but um, because history, um, I didn't, I didn't grow up in a family that cultivates the Mapute um, culture. Uh, at my home, um, I just grew up with, with my family, but after a long time, when I was, I think, seven, eight years ago, I started wondering, okay, so what it means to be Mapute? Um, where, uh, what are my connection with my roots, with this with this community? Because in the beginning, I didn't know nothing about it. We know what happened with the original people around the world, right? Uh, the, all the um, governments, they didn't want to share the culture. They bring the Catholicists into the, um, the Americas. So I never grew up uh, learning about my my <clears throat> my roots. So this has been a discovery, a personal discovery and connection for me. Uh, so I am still learning. I'm still uh, in a moment in my life that I'm trying to get more and more connected, get more knowledge, and try and also try to share this excitement uh, with people. Because even if you are not, you didn't <clears throat> grow up in a family where you are connected with your roots. If you have the sense that you want to get connected, you can start to do it. You can get out, get go find a book, start talking with your family, with your grandparents, and just uh, connect with them. So it's an invitation that I'm giving to people. I'm saying that if you want to connect, you can do it. It doesn't matter when. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about Mapuche culture and its cosmovision of the universe. As I say, this is a... Um, this presentation is not going to go into too deep in details. It's more as a general view about this, this topic. So first of all, we're going to start talking about where the Mapute is located. So Mapute uh, people is located not just in Chile, but also in Argentina too. We share a land. This land, we call it the Walmapu. The Walmapu, which is mean land, surface, or where we live, where the Mapuche lives. Here on this map, you can look where is this strong orange. It says Walmapu, and that shares part of Chile and Argentina. I also want to say this is not an actual uh, map, but uh, it's an idea where the Mapuches were located long, long time ago, and there is still Mapuches living in both countries both sides of the of the Cordillera de los Andes. Um, the Mapuche community, as all the other original people around the world, they have um, their own language, which is called Mapudungun. And Mapudungun is the speak of the earth. Actually, it's um, a word that it comes 
from two words from the Mapu Dungun, which is Mapu and Dungun or Sungun. Mapu, it means land. And Sungun, it is the speech, the voice, that energy that, that came from you to communicate with the others. And the Mapu Dungun, um, to be able to speak uh, Mapu Dungun, you need to get connected with uh, the with your environment. And depending where, where you live on the Mapuche land, on the Wal Mapu, the Mapu Dungun is not going to be the same for the whole Mapuche community. So it's, it's different. If you live close to the Cordillera de los Andes or if you live close to the to the ocean, the Mapu Dungun is not going to be the same for all. And also, uh, Mapuches, uh, we have a um, um, type of learning, and this type of learning we call them kumufalen. And the kumufalen is that we learn by doing, right? And I think a lot of other indigenous people around the world did the same. We learn by doing. There were no books, so you just look at your dad or your family, how they do things, and you learn by doing kumufalen. So I made this some time ago for, an, for another presentation and I wanted to share it here with you today. So this is a close look to the south of Chile. So right here on the top, here is my city, Chillán. And then uh, you're going down and you're getting more to the uh, south, south, south of Chile. So we have different communities, Mapuche, that live on, around this area. And depending on where you live is uh, how you call your community. So we say um, in Mapudungun, we say she, which is C-H-E, che, it means people. So if we say Mapu, che, that is people from the Mapu, Mapu is land, so it's people from the land. In this case, if you live next to the Cordillera, next to the, the Andes Mountains, we say the people located around here is called uh, Pehuenche. Che is people. And Pehuen, Pehuen is a um, fruit which is called um, the Pehuen uh, that comes from the, uh, the Araucaria. In the Araucaria, is located in the Cordillera de los Andes. So if people is called their Pehuenche, that means they're coming from the, the leaf uh, next to the Cordillera, next to the Andes. If you live next to the, the ocean, we'd say that is Lafkenche. With che, it means people, but Lafken means that you are located more close to the depending on where you live, um, you are you are all Mapuche, but you can be Pehuenche if you live next to the Cordillera, you can be Lafkenche, or it can be a mix um of the territories. <clears throat> so when I start my personal um my, my personal connection with the Mapuche community, with my root, I I started to listen about this this um, word, cosmovision. So I look a concept to try to understand it a little bit better. We know that it's not just one concept that, that there is a general for cosmovision. There are different interpretations, but I kind of like this one. The worldview consists on the assumptions, premises, and ideologies of a social cultural group that determines how they perceive the world. And also, I will add the, how they interact with the world. So it's not the same for everyone. And that also depends a lot for where you are located. And this is a picture that I took in the south of Chile, Laguna y Calma in 2018, which is Mapuche territory. And I think it's just beautiful and I wanted to share it with you. Okay, so Mapuche people, they, uh, as I said before, uh, they, they learn by doing. And um, the Mapuche Tati is, a, is super important because Mapuche Tati is to be Mapuche. And to be Mapuche, you need to be in a certain level of confidence, connection with your community and also connection and respect for the land and where you have around. For example, if you go to the mountains and you want to go for an expedition or you're looking something, you always have to talk to the map, to the land. And then when you leave and you go back home, you have to talk back to the land the Mapu and tell them thank you for um, what we have here. Thank you for what you're giving us and thank you for the opportunity to be here. As um, Mapuche Tati, to be Mapuche, 
uh, there is need to be, like I say, in a higher level of connection with yourself, with your community, and what is around you. The social organization, the basis for the Mapuche community um, of the social organization is the family. And the family lives together and they're called love. So uh, this is a picture that I took in Cañete and the south of Chile in 2017 with um, an organization that I belong to, which is called Maputrafun. Uh, we went into a trip to the south of Chile to get connected with our roots and learn more about Mapuche community. So the lady uh, staying up there in the picture, that's my aunt. And she and behind her is um, the um, uh, love of the houses uh, from Mapuche community from long time ago. So um, there is a, there is a history that um, tried to talk a little bit about the existence of Mapuche and how they started their life. So a little bit before I say that uh, to be Mapuche is really important to respect and just be in harmony with what is around. But then long, long time ago, uh, when the elders tell this story, and long time ago, there were two, two snakes, Tren Tren and Kai Kai Bilu. So one belongs to the land and the other one belongs to the to the ocean and they start a fight. And during this fight, the water start to raise and people start running to the mountains because they were going to um, get under the water. And during this fight, um, the um, snake, Kai Kai start moving more and more strong. So the water were going up and up. So Chen trends realize about it and it start turn trend is the snake from the land and it start just going up and up and that's the way how it saved a few Mapuche people that are now they're wanting to kill because of the race of the water. This is a story that comes from really long long time ago. Um and there is still try to there's different um people that think that is related to an earthquake that is this story try to really talk about a big big um phenomena that happened a long time ago in the south of chile in the americas and i think it's a it's a great story to share with all of you and this is a picture also that I took in Valdivia in the south of Chile. If you go to Corral, you will see this picture about Tren Tren and Kai Kai Bilu. And this, that's me and my son where there you can see Kai Kai and Tren Tren. And then you can see the volcanoes and the water just moving. It's a beautiful, beautiful um, paint about the story. <clears throat> So Mapuche people, they also look at the stars. As in so many other originals around the world, they look at the stars and because of their observation and they can a connection, the impact the develop of their culture. So uh, the skies, we call them um, Wenu Mapu. Mapu, as I said earlier from Mapu Dungun, it means Mapu is land and Wenu is up. So it's like the land above. <clears throat> so there are different interpretations about um, what is um, the um, Wenu Mapu means and how people or uh, Mapuche people is connected or interpret what is there. So what we know is that um, from Mapuche community, not all the content that I'm going to be sharing here is mean. It is the same for the whole community. There are different interpretations depending on where you're coming from, which community you're coming from, and also depending on the knowledge that your family was able to pass to the generation by generation. So one of the interpretations is that there are different layers, and all these layers, we have, um, um, we have the spirits living on up of our heads. So we have uh, here, I, uh, the, we have the Mapu, that is where we live. And in the Mapu live um, is a mix or between the good and the bad and where we live. Under our feet is the Minche Mapu. And that is, and, and then up of our head, we have the Ancawenu, which is kind of right about 
right, right above our heads. And then we have the four layers, they com all combined together uh, is the Wenumapu. And there is where the spirits live. Uh, so I ha I took this from a book that I, read, uh, that I read. So if someone wanted to, I can share it with everyone. There are also these other classifications. So we have um, we have the mapu, this orange, I guess, um, color. The mapu is where we live. The minche mapu is what is be, um, be, um, um, uh, uh, behind our, no, after our feet, I'm sorry. And then we have the wenu mapu and all the different layers that uh, they is divided on. Depending on the layer, you will find different type of energy or connection with the spirits. And um, and the Anka Mapu is the layer that is right uh, next to our heads. And then a little more up, up, it will come the Wenu Mapu. So Based on these uh, two um, graphics that I'm showing here, so we know now the Mapuche also has looked to the sky and the sky and the observation of it and the interpretation has um, made an impact on the development of the culture. So we also look at, at the stars and we also have constellations. The constellation we call them Wallen. And depending where you're coming from, these constellations are gonna, um, their impact, it can be varied, it can be an interpretation that might be related to livestock, climate, um, social or spiritual environment. And there are differences on their identification also. As I said before, we have different communities in the one mapu. So for some Mapuche, well, some constellation may mean something, and for some other it may mean something different. So this is not the same for everyone. And most of them are located um, near to the Milky Way. And I'm gonna share two of them with you today. So we have the um, Wailuwetro. Wailuwetro is an ancient sport from long, long time ago, we have the Mapuche uh, men, uh, there were warriors. And to see the strongest or to define who's gonna be the next chief of the community, they did some, some sports. And one of them is the one we're showing here. So we have two men that tie a rope between them and both of them pull to the opposite sides. So, um, Looking at the skies, Mapuche see this, and they are used, the, this correspond to Orion belt and the M42 and M43 of the nebula, um, Orion nebula. So this is being used as a temporal and a spiritual connection for some of the communities of, of Mapuche communities. <clears throat> Another constellation, which is more and more um, relevant and is more known, is uh, the Wanako, Manke. So this is a representation from the two Western constellations, the tail of the scorpions and two star from the Ark of Sagittarius. And it's being used as a, unit, as a temporary unit. And also, depending on the, the position uh, of the year, you can recognize um, and you can use it as a night clock or to see um, uh, in the winter season. I want to say also that these two constellations, these two representation of the constellation that I'm showing here today, the Willy Trau and the Manke, I took it from the book that is called Wenumapu, Astrology and Cosmology Mapuche from 2015. And uh, this is a book from uh, Margarita Canillo and um, oh, oh, Margarita Canillo and Juan Pozo. They both work on the um, are from Mapuche community, and they did a research on the south of Chile. They talked with uh, with people from there, and they uh, they came up with this book that called talks about the relation between the people Mapuche people and the skies. I also recommend that if someone wants to look at it. <clears throat> also, the sun, of course, is important, and the sun it calls Antu, and the sun uh it's been working in so many different ways. Uh, it works as a 
clock, right? We can see when the day is gonna begin. When we see the sun is right up of our heads, we know that it's the midday. Also for the Mapuche community to have the energy that comes from the sun is super important. So we build the houses so that you can have their doors open to, to receive that the light that when the sun rises in the morning, that energy they get into your ruka and your house to start your day. Kuyen is the moon. Uh, moon is super important, uh, mostly in a spiritual ways of connection between Mapuche people and their spirits. Um, and there are different type of interpretation depending where you are from. Also, the eclipses. For Mapuche community, eclipses is not something good. It's more related to something that is uh, that is something that's going to happen and it's not really, really good. Um, we talk about there is a fight between the good and the bad. So if it's a total eclipse, um, we say that is something bad is going to happen, but not something bad is going to happen right away. It's something that can happen maybe in a few more months. And, that's, and also, it's something that can happen in a bad way for the community maybe it can be something like uh, it's gonna be a little an earthquake but if we have a total eclipse the community needs to watch out the community needs to press attention and be connected with what is going on around because something is coming that is his interpretation and if the eclipse is not total eclipse, so that means there's something good. There's not nothing bad uh, coming because the fight between the good and the bad, the good won because it wasn't a total eclipse. So we also have, um, well, the star, which is not a star, are planets, but they call them as a stars. We have the star that brings the dawn, which is the one alpha. Uh, this is Venus or Jupiter in its morning phase. And the star that brings the night, that's uh, Jupiter in the evening phase, and that we call them Japan. We, um, Mapuche people use this too as a watch. And also if they're traveling, for example, there's one community needs to go and go to some, some place and they know how long it's gonna start. If they look at the sky and they see the Wenefle, they will know it's time to, um, to just stay here. We're gonna uh, pass the night here and then we will keep moving on the next morning. So the uses of astronomy, as I just been saying in this presentation, is very. Is, it has different application. It can be orientation, travel time, harvest, and organization of the of the states of the years. Um, so there are different interpretations, and I think there is a lot more that we need to learn and connect with um, the Mapuche astronomy. Um, as a Chilean, uh, it's really sad for me that when I, went, I was in the school, I never, no one talked to me about this. And also they talked to me about the Incas and the Mayas and how they did the calendar and how they studied the stars. But um, our original people from Chile, they did that too. They look at the skies, they connect with them, and they get interpretation that help them to live long, long, long time ago. And that interpretation helped them to know when they need to do, go for the harvest, when is what is good time to, to do to plant the potatoes. And that is a really valuable uh, knowledge and data that we need to learn more about and we need to spread the word that this success. So as I said in the beginning of the presentation, um, I didn't grow up in a family that is that has this the the culture that lives the culture. Actually, didn't really realize what it means to be Mapuche just till eight years ago. So based on a family, um, on a family need of connect and a family need to know what it means to be Mapuche, it came this organization, which is located in Chillán Viejo, and this organization, Maputrafun, uh, we try to connect with our roots. We try to learn. We try to get our community together, and everyone who's Mapuche want to learn and be in a community that has the same uh, curiosity uh, is welcome. So this is part of our community that uh, was 
I think 2017, we had one of the first course of Mapudungu language. So we were getting our diploma there. We passed uh, the first. I am right there behind, right here. That's me. Maybe you're not seeing me, but I was there so happy getting my diploma. This is also another picture for our organization. Um, this is my aunt and this is part of the community there. When I was living in Chile, we were always getting together and doing activities and learning and connecting, connected uh, with all. This is another one that I just want to share with you. Um, they're, they're in the city. They're, not, they're walking around with our with the typical um, dress of Mapuche woman. And they would just went out and walk around because they want the people seeing this is it's normal. And um, you can see people dressing however they want it and how they feel it. And this is not something that you use it once a year. So, and we 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 are connected with the original people. We need to respect them. That's my aunt, and that's me in a presentation that we did long time ago, also in Tian Viejo. One of the first activities that we we'll start doing with the organization. And that's another one that we were invited uh, to go to schools and we talk with uh, students, we talk with little ones. And the most, the most, I think one of the best questions they do is they do with the kids is, okay, I ask them what it means, what is Mapuche? And the little ones always say, is there people from the past? So I tell them that it's not, Mapuche are not from the past, Mapuche are from the present. And we are here today to talk to you there. There have been Mapuches in the past, but the Mapuche is still in the present. And now we're working together to the next generation to know what it means to be Mapuche. Um, so I just, like I said before, I invite you. If you haven't connected with your roots, it's never late. You can always do it and you will be really in love. Like I am in love with my culture too. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope I did good English today. I speak very fast, so Andrew, please tell me that it wasn't that bad today. And thank you, everyone. <laughs> that was wonderful. That was absolutely amazing. That was really cool, Yasmin. Thank you so much for sharing this wonderful insight into your beautiful culture. It's just fantastic and i'm sure a lot of people around the world who are wa watching this live or be watching this recording because it will be archived on our facebook page and our youtube page at uh, astronomers without borders they're going to be i think uh you know it's an eye opener to see the you know there are differences around the world but yet there are similarities and i recognize you know it's wonderful to see the the objects that i grew up here in montreal canada in the great white north, I can still recognize some of that in the sky and in the stories that you are you are mentioning. So it is absolutely fantastic. Let me let me bring uh, Edmundo in uh, as well. Whereas uh, all three of us are here. Hi, Edmundo. Great. I'm so happy you could stay with us. Um, you know, it's it is fantastic. I wanted to ask both of you. Uh, maybe uh, Edmundo, I can ask you first. Um, what is the process now in terms of of telling these 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 cultural stories about the night sky? How is that done today? You know, I mean, we're living in with the the, the power of the internet. We have a lot of technology. How has that in influenced uh, how storytelling is done today? We are we are working a lot with the children at schools and uh, here in uh, in Rapa Nui that is a name the uh, indigenous name for Easter Island. Everybody has a great great interest in recovering everything that has to do with their past culture. So we are very fortunate that uh, the people in Polynesia and on Easter Island are very proud of their past, especially with all these statues that all the people want to visit and see. So they, they are very proud about their past and they want to learn everything they can. They understand perfectly well that, of course, this part of the past has nothing to do with, of course, our scientific knowledge of today, but they want to learn that also. They want to know everything. So we are very fortunate. And we are very fortunate to have also Jasmine telling us about 
another part of Chile that is so abandoned as south of Chile with the Mapuche culture that is also a wonderful indigenous culture of Chile. Fantastic to hear the similarities and the differences too. And Edmundo, I mean, you're you're working with a, a, a really great facility there, the Rapa Nui Planetarium as well. I mean, that must function as well as a planetarium for your, uh, you know, your, uh, your community as a focus point for being able to tell these stories and engaging people, right? I mean, that's what the planetarium can do. <laughs> Yes, exactly. That's what we do. And the planetarium, we created it about in about four years ago. I tore down the living of my house to build the dome for the planetarium. And uh, that's how we started. And today we have about 10 people that work with us, that assist us. We have teachers in different schools that are planning new things. We are going with the children to the field to visit all these archaeological sites and try and learn what we can by the position of the stars and what we know of ancient lore that connects with those sites. So it's an it's a ongoing thing. It is an everyday uh, day of learning, of, uh, of uh, working with these children and, and with the people of the ice. And I uh, just want to say uh, just the folks watching right now that we've got the on the ticker below, you'll see the the um, the website address for Rapa Nui Planetarium as well. So if people do can check that out. We've got it in the comments section. So it's linked there. You just click on it and it'll take you there. And by the way, uh, I absolutely love Edmundo, the uh, the video that's on the front page. Uh, uh, it's just a beautiful video showcasing the skies are just fantastic where you are. Uh -huh. It is sometimes because it's most of the time cloudy, but when we have a beautiful night, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. Now, listen, Yasmin, I wanted to ask you for, you know, I listening to your presentation, um, I'm wondering and you, you touched on it at the end of it with the youngsters, the children, the next generation is, you know, and that you mentioned that the youngsters have this feeling that this is the past. These are things in the past and ancient, ancient things. But you are pointing out that, no, this is something that's today. It's part of their culture today. How is that really? Is that a, you find that a common issue? Uh, that uh, passing down this kind of tradition to the youngsters, is that something difficult to do? Is it easier to do now? Or is it, is it, is it uh, you, know, you know, what is the situation really? Is it, uh, I'd like to know. <laughs> okay, well, well two years ago, when I, when, I arrived, when I arrived to Easter Island, when you talked about the past, and uh, they told you uh, an oral tradition of the first king that arrived to the island or something like that, they wouldn't believe it. I mean, it was it was a truth. If the king had arrived 500 generations ago on the 21st of March, it was the 21st of March, and it was that that was a truth. And nobody ever doubts any stories. Although they were, if you got together five elderly people, everyone had a different version of the same story or slightly different. So there was always discussions and things like that. But today, people know perfectly well what is oral tradition. They know what is a story and they know what is reality. So that is not interfering. What they are interested in is now be able to learn what these markings that we find on the rocks, these petroglyphs, these maps of the stars, how they relate to the ancient calendars how they were used in the past. And that is what we are trying to solve. We are trying to discover. We are trying to, 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 to see how this works. We don't know. We are all just trying there to find out. That's all. And uh, Yasmin, uh, uh, in, with, with your, your cultural uh, ties, what, what's your point of view on that and giving it to the youngsters and that connection with the youngsters and what they're thinking? Well, I think that today uh, they are more open to um, know about the original people from Chile. In Chile specifically, I will say 
10 years ago, I mean, 20 years ago, it wasn't something that was easy. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, it was really hard to do. But right now in Chile, there's happening a lot of social movements. And I just love to see young people taking the lead on, in their education and seeing that they have the right to know about their original people. They want to get connected with them. They want to know which uh, they belong to and how to learn more. I just love that that young energy that came from all the students and people in Chile. They are taking the lead of their own education and find ways to connect with community. It's, it's great. That's fantastic. I think we're in a good moment to, to, to start talking about original people and their cosmovision of the universe, their connect with the earth. And yeah, it's, I think it's great. It is. It's a fantastic time. I think with the technology we have too, it's just it just allows the storytelling that engages the young young generation. You know, I mean, it's important to me able to make that connection so they can continue on the the stories uh, and and that the all all that shared heritage. I think we're going to turn to some questions here uh, that we got some from the audience. Uh, we've got one for you, Yasmin, uh, from Sammy. And Sammy asks, uh, are many Mapuche today that are drawn to sharing this cultural astronomy? Is it something, I guess, is it po popular with Mapuche today to share that, share these things, stories? Uh, like I said before, uh, we are in a moment uh, that uh, people wants to get connected with the roots and they're trying to learn and they want to share that connection and that knowledge with the people, with the community. They want to open uh, talks and just say, hey, this is this original people I belong to. This is why I've been learning. In my case, as I said before, it's been a personal connection and connection with my roots because, and I think there's so many others in Chile and around the world, they didn't grow up. Uh, in, a, in, in a community where they hear their original language, where they knew about the connection with the sky and with the earth. Because what happened with this story, right? Our, our grand grandfathers, they were scared to tell us a story. They didn't want us to speak Mapudungun because if you're walking on the street and you're talking Mapudungun, they can take you and they're not going to see you again. So a lot of people, because of they, uh, you want to protect your family, and because this story, they just say, okay, well, I'm not gonna teach you how to talk Mapudungun. I'm not gonna talk to you about our connection with the sky. And I wanna keep you safe. And so uh, we now have to learn how to speak Spanish. And we need to talk about God. So there's a lot of things that happen, but it's good to see people um, and young people a lot more, more talks. Sometimes I go and I see someone here is talking about Mabuchi, someone here is talking about Likan and Tai, someone here is talking about this other one. So it's just like a boon of information and it, it's great to see those activities going on. Yeah, it's great to see the youngsters engage, definitely. So we have uh, one more, let's see, question here. Um, I think this one, yeah, we'll take this one from our friend Tim Spock, who happens to be the chair chairperson of uh, Astronomers Without <laughs> Borders. Uh, hi, Tim. Great question for, I think, both of our guests. What do you feel is one of the most important lessons that people today can learn from the Rapa Nui and Mapuche cultures and incorporate in their everyday life for Cosmovision today? Uh, Edmundo, maybe you can take this question first. How can we all? How can we all take away? Everyone listening to this broadcast around the world, take away something from your precious piece of the world. What can we take away? Um, I think the most important thing about this is that mankind it doesn't matter. Mankind in general, when we looked at the sky, when we were amazed by that darkness sometime in the past we were able to find answers we had to answer to ourselves what we were seeing what it meant and since then we have developed astronomy we have developed all this knowledge today that permits us to go even to far away planets but we're all related because we are related of that first thought about that far away place that 
is unknown. It is the unknown that keeps us together. And all these stories, the only thing they do is to try to explain different moments in different lives of different cultures around the world in which we were trying to explain to ourselves that darkness, that unknown that we saw and experience every night. Wow, that's a, and Yasmin, what, do you, what about you? What do you think that from the Mapuche culture that everyone around the world can learn from? Learn how to be a warrior. Warrior, warrior in your life. Um, um, well, from the situation of the universe point of view, I will say that it's just amazing how original people from a long, long time ago, they look at the sky, but they didn't just look, they observe. And after they observe, they didn't just stay there, they also connect. And um, today there is maybe, I think there's people have lost that. There's lost that curiosity and that connection with what is around. And we'll just focus on some other things and maybe that, that they fool you for the moment, but there is so much around you that sometimes you need to just open a little bit more your eyes and not just look with your eyes, also look with your hair your heart and try to connect what you have around beautifully said beautifully said uh I, both of you i mean this is just fantastic i think there's one more comment it's a comment i think more than a question uh so to finish this evening's wonderful program off uh, i can't say it any better sammy says this sends this out to both of you uh where is it let me see here uh that he says that he wants to say thank you for both of you for doing an amazing work to inspire cultural astronomy and ancestral connection to heritage. So a big, a, a big thank you to both of you for that. Uh, Yasmin, Edmundo, it, just a fantastic, what a pleasure uh, to, to be with you this evening on this show. Uh, um, I love what you guys do, what you represent, you're bringing into the 21st century and, and beyond uh, the heritage that has gone back for thousands of years and that nobody will ever forget. Nobody, we, you're, you're the torch bearers for this and it's, it's so important and I'm so happy that you could share this with us tonight, uh, a little insight into it. And I hope you guys, both of you can come back again in the future and uh, we can learn more about your beautiful uh, cultures. So thank you to both of you this evening. Uh, and uh, I hope that we'll see each other very, very soon. And everyone out there, uh, wherever you are around the world, the night sky is our shared heritage. And I hope that all of you have taken a lesson out of tonight of uh, how beautiful it is and how diverse the stories of the night sky are. Uh, we've got the comments open so you can continue uh, chatting uh, after this uh, discussion. And this will be posted on our YouTube, Astronomers Without Borders YouTube channel as well. So we invite you to do watch it and share it with your network as well. And don't forget, we're still in Global Astronomy Month. Uh, we are not finished. This week we've got on April 29th, finishing off the month is our Cosmic Concert. Uh, by Giovanni Renzo uh, in Italy. Beautiful concert, uh, it specifically created for Global Astronomy Month, the world's largest celebration of the night sky and astronomy. We invite you, of course, is do come and visit us on our uh, website. Uh, you'll see our Global Astronomy Month calendar, uh, all the different events that are being held. Uh, are, many of them are recorded, and the upcoming ones as well are all there. We invite you to become a member of uh, Astronomers Without Borders. We have different levels of membership uh, for everyone uh, around the world to participate. We'd love to see you uh, come on board with us where we, of course, build and cultivate community through astronomy. Uh, with that, I wish all of you guys, wherever you are around the world, stay safe and healthy. And until next time, I wish all of you clear skies. Bye-bye.
From the pale blue dot to the distant stars, we are one. One people, one sky.